or Super Sunday, so you guys can head out for that. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I got a, a note from Eric DeHinden, and for those of you who are here and did not read the newsletter this week, um, uh, Wednesday after uh, the DeHindens were, they had just finished dinner out together, they were getting back in the car, and as they got to the car, Sherry collapsed as she was getting into the car. Uh, and Eric called 911, got her out, did CPR. Uh, the, me the, the EMTs were there. Uh, she did not have a pulse. They were able to revive her, bring a pulse back. Not, uh, not revive her, but get, get her to have a pulse again. Got her to the hospital. She lost pulse. They got it back uh, and put her on the, the respirator, on the ventilator. And uh, that's been essentially her condition since... Uh, what happened on Wednesday night. Uh, they've been running tests, CAT scans, e EEGs, EKGs, and this morning he said uh, still no definitive response from Sherry. The cardiologist ca just came by and advised us that her heart suffered damage. Uh, injection fraction is down to 35. He said that if she could recover neurologically, she would likely require an implanted defib defibrillator. The EEG and CAT scan is planned for later today. Hopeful that those two, two tests will give us a better idea of the neurological damage. Sherry indicated that she wanted to be an organ donor. Brian, who is Eric's son, and I are discussing that with the hospital staff. We've also made initial contact with the funeral home. Seems more and more likely that Jesus may have called her home Wednesday night and has given Brian and me a few more days to release her. Thanks for all your prayers. Uh, he texted me and asked if we'd could get together and start making plans for her memorial service. So uh, God may still do a miracle. We're still asking him to do that. But in the midst of this, uh, we're asking God to pour out his grace on Eric and uh, especially on Brian. So pray with me if you would. Uh, Father, we do uh, come to you this morning with heavy hearts. Uh, as I think about Eric having been married to Sherry for 44 years, and about just how they have ministered to one another and uh, the joy that their marriage has been. It's hard to imagine that this is a release time for him. And Lord, uh, you are the God who called Lazarus out of the tomb. And so we know what your power is capable of, but we don't presume on that. We also know that uh, our times are in your hand. And so while we would ask that you might bring a miraculous recovery to Sherry, we also ask that you would prepare our hearts, and especially Eric and Brian's hearts, for whatever is ahead. And Lord, we pray that uh, the peace of Christ that passes all understanding would keep their hearts and minds in you, that you would keep them in perfect peace as their minds are stayed on you. And we pray for Brian, and we pray that as he contemplates that the end of every life is this transition, that he would even now be thinking about his own transition and what is ahead for him, and that you by your spirit might stir faith in him. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3 in our ongoing study of the book of Romans. Let me give you a heads up. We're going to be looking at four verses this morning at the end of Romans chapter 3 verses 27 through verses 31 and we won't be looking at those verses until about 1115 so just letting you know if it seems like how come we're not getting to the verses we're going to get to the verses but I got a long runway before we take off this morning okay so just heads up on that last week if you were here Curtis Thomas took us through a master class complete with a pop quiz on one of the most significant passages in all of Scripture. He took us through Romans 3, verses 21 through 26, where Paul explains what was essentially a significant transition for him, a significant paradigm shift in how he understands our relationship with God or his relationship with God. This paradigm shift altered completely the trajectory of the Apostle Paul's life. Now, you are probably familiar with that term, paradigm shift, right? You know what that means. Back in 1962, there was a, an American physicist and philosopher, a guy named Thomas Kuhn, who first used that phrase, paradigm shift, in a, uh, 
in a paper that he wrote, and he said, a paradigm shift describes what happens when someone has a fundamental change or shift in how they approach a matter or in the underlying assumptions that they have about how something works. A paradigm shift is when you go, I've always thought it's this way, and now I understand it's different. That's what happened for Paul. Paradigm shift involves this new understanding or discovery of a subject. Uh, you remember that Archimedes had a paradigm shift when he was taking a bath, right? You know who Archimedes is? Archimedes was the guy, he was the third century BC. He was a, a, a mathematician and the, the story is that the king in Archimedes' day came to him suspicious that the guy who made the crowns for the king was, was cheating and using alloy instead of pure gold on the crowns. And he asked Archimedes, how can I test these? How can I know if this is pure gold or not? And Archimedes was trying to solve that problem and thinking about it and thinking about it. And one day when he was taking a bath, he recognized that his mass in the bathtub caused the water to rise and there was something about the weight. And anyway, I don't understand how it all worked, but in the middle of his bath, he popped up. This is how the story goes. He popped up and he shouted, what did he shout? Eureka, Eureka, which is a Greek word that means I found it. He shouted Eureka, and he, the story is that he ran through the streets of, of uh, Syracuse naked because he was so excited about what he'd found. Now, we don't know if any of that's true, but that's the legend that's been passed down to us. That was his Eureka moment, his paradigm shift. He's trying to solve a problem. All of a sudden, it dawns on him. This is how I solve it. Author Stephen Covey, who wrote the book of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks in one of his chapters about the need for us to have paradigm shifts in our lives, he tells this story. He says, I remember a mini paradigm shift that I experienced one morning on a subway in New York. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some just resting with their eyes closed. I was uh, there. It was a calm, peaceful scene. And then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway the children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate in the car changed. The man sat down next to me, closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing. And yet the man sitting next to me did nothing. It was difficult not to be irritated. I couldn't believe he would be so insensitive as to let his children run wild and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everybody else on the subway was irritated, too. So finally, with what I felt was unusual patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a bit more. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and then so said softly, Oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know how to think. I guess I didn't know how to, I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Well, Covey says, can you imagine how I felt at that moment? My paradigm had shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently because I, and because I saw things differently, I thought differently. And because I thought differently, I felt differently and I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was now filled with this man's pain. Feelings of th sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Oh, your wife just died. I am so sorry. Tell me about it. What can I do to help? Everything, he said, changed in an instant. New data caused him to think differently about what he had been thinking just seconds before. And it changed, did you know what he said? It changed how I thought, changed how I felt, it changed how I acted. It changed everything. Because when a paradigm shifts, things change. Everything changes. How you think, how you feel, how you respond. Here's my last example of a paradigm shift. How many of you here are over the age of 50? Raise your hand if you're more than 50 years old. Okay, if you're one of the people, just raise your hand. I can imagine... <laughs> It's a case of a wife not wanting to raise her hand or husband forcing her to do it. Yeah, I understand. Okay. If you just raised your hand, I, I imagine with pretty good authority that I know what you were doing sometime 40 years ago this month. Because most of us who are over the age of 50, 40 years ago this month, found ourselves at some point in a darkened room with a group of strangers staring at a screen and watching our 
paradigm shift when we saw Han Solo take the Millennium Falcon into light speed. Why, here, here's what we saw. Watch this right here, okay? Kill the lights here. We need them all off. Yeah. Okay, how cool is that, right? It's still cool today. Now, some of you are looking at it going, that is not cool, that is so cheesy. That's because you're young and you grew up expecting that computer-generated special effects should look better than even that. They did not have swanky computers back in 1977 to do that. This was a paradigm shift in how you saw special effects in movies, visual effects. In fact, it was such a big deal that George Lucas, the guy who did it, set up his own company, the Industrial Light and Magic Company, to do visual effects for movies because other mo movie makers were looking at the jump to light speed and going, how'd you do that? That was so cool. I remember sitting there thinking, we just went into light speed, feeling like the theater had just lunged forward. It was a paradigm shift. And now, every time you went and saw a special effect, you expected it to be that cool. Now, the reason we're talking about paradigm shifts is because the passage we're looking at, the passage last week and the passage this week, represents a significant paradigm shift in the life of the Apostle Paul in his understanding of one big idea, one big concept. And in the providence of God, it's a concept we've already looked at this morning in the Catechism, the word, the idea that Paul had a paradigm shift about is the word righteousness. Righteousness is the theme idea, the theme word in the book of Romans. Most of us use that word or hear that word and we don't really know what we're talking about when we talk about righteousness. If I ask you to define for me what is righteousness, you might say something like, well, it's right living. That's not a bad definition. But most of the time when we think about righteousness, we think about righteousness being um, moral goodness. A righteous person is a morally good person. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. I'm going to give you my definition of righteousness. And let me tell you, just before I give it to you, I didn't dig this up from anybody, so it could be wrong, okay? Okay. But as I like to think about righteousness, this captures for me, this helps me understand what it is that Romans is about, what it is that Paul was thinking about when he talked about all of this, what righteousness is. And, and you, you may remember the thesis statement for the book in, of Romans found back in chapter 1, verse 17. At the end of verse 17, it says, the righteous will live by faith. That's the paradigm shift. Paul's old way of thinking was the righteous will live by keeping the law. The paradigm shift is the righteous live by faith. And that was a dramatic paradigm shift. So what is righteousness? Here's my definition. Righteousness is being in perfect agreement and alignment with the purposes of God and the ways of God for our life and for the world. The righteousness is when you think, act, and speak in perfect alignment and in perfect agreement with the purposes of God and the ways of God, not just what he's doing, but how he's doing it in our lives and in this world. So here's how we'd say this. We would say a righteous person is a person whose thinking and speaking and acting is always in perfect alignment with what God is thinking and acting. How he's in perfect alignment with God's purposes and God's ways for the world and for his own life. Conversely, you would say if a person is in perfect alignment with the purposes and ways of God, if that's how we think and act and speak, then we're a righteous person. Now, that will include moral goodness, but it's bigger than moral goodness. It means that what God is about is what you're about. You are righteous when you are aligned with the purposes and the ways of God. By the way, that's the relationship that the members of the Trinity have. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are in perfect agreement, perfect alignment 
with with the purposes and plans of the Godhead. There's never been a time when God the Father thought one thing and God the Son thought, eh, I'm not so sure. Never been a time when the Holy Spirit has said, eh, maybe we ought to think about this. No, they are in perfect alignment and agreement with what they're doing and how they're doing it. And they enjoy perfect fellowship because of that perfect alignment and agreement. They're in perfect oneness with one another. And so the question is, how do we get in on that? How do we get into that circle and enjoy that fellowship? Well, to do it, we have to be in alignment. We have to have righteousness. Now, how you get into that circle, how you, how you pursue and achieve righteousness ought to be the central question of your life. It ought to be the central question of everybody's life. Everybody should be asking, how can my life be in alignment with the purposes uh, and the ways of God? There's no more important question than that one. Because answering that question has eternal implications. Your alignment with God means you live with him forever and as a part of his family. But anytime you are not in alignment with God, when you choose not to align yourself with the purposes and ways of God, you're choosing to put your own, own ways of thinking or your own ways of acting ahead of what God would say. You're saying, I know better than God. That's rebellion against God. And that puts you in a place where you become an enemy of God. And God says that his enemies will face judgment on the last day. So you have to be asking, do I want my life to be in alignment with God or do I want to be in charge of my own life and be an enemy of God? So Paul has been spending his life trying to figure out the answer to this question. How can I lead a righteous life? How can I be in alignment with the purposes and plans of God? Now let me stop here and just say something for a minute, okay? In the midst of the day-to-day -day stuff that we all live with, this may not sound like a particularly relevant question. A lot of people who come to a church service are hoping that we're going to look at what the Bible teaches us about the relevant issues of life. And a lot of churches spend time trying to make sure that they build their worship service to address these relevant issues. And there is nothing wrong with looking at what does the Bible say about my finances or about my relationships or about my emotional state. Because the Bible speaks to all kinds of things. What does the Bible say about how I should function on the job or how I should raise my kids? All of those are important things. But one of the functions of coming together in a worship service like this and looking at the Bible is for the Bible to tell us what we ought to be thinking about rather than for us to say, here's what I'm thinking about, Bible, inform me. We come to the Bible and say, not this is what's important, so how do I figure this out? We come to the Bible and say, tell me what's important. We're in this passage because Jesus tells us this is important. You may look at it and say, this doesn't feel relevant. Jesus says it ought to feel more relevant to you than you may think it is. This is significant. You may not thought much, have thought much this week about how do I align my life with the purposes and ways of God. That may not have been a conscious thought of yours, but as you come to the scriptures this morning, God's word is saying to us, that's the most important issue you ought to be thinking about. And the fact that you're not thinking about it says less about how relevant the Bible is and more about your, how irrelevant the things you're thinking about are, right? So this is a very important question. It was a central question to Paul's life. For Paul, as a Pharisee, the way he answered that question throughout his life was this way. Here's how you become a righteous person. You keep God's law. You become a Pharisee. If you do that, God will welcome you into his family. That was Paul's answer to that question. But he knew, deep in his soul, there was a problem with that answer. What's the problem with the answer? If you want to be a righteous person, keep God's law. What's the problem? Can't do it. Paul knew that. If the definition is being in perfect alignment and agreement with the purposes of God and the ways of God for our life and for the world, can anyone here say, I have done that today? I did it yesterday. You see, that's the problem. How do we, even a good law-keeping Pharisee is never in perfect alignment with the purposes and ways of God. In the back of Paul's mind, he knew that. He knew his life didn't measure up. And the Pharisees knew that. So here's what the Pharisees did. What the Pharisees did is what a lot of people do today when it comes to God's standard is perfect alignment with his ways and his purposes. 
I can't measure up to that standard, therefore I will dumb the standard down. This is the first way you deal with it. If I can't, if, if somebody says, in order to win the gold medal in the pole vault, and I, I'm bringing up the pole vault because I don't know if you know that Chad Donnelly was a pole vaulter at the University of Arkansas. Is that right, Chad? What year, what years were you there? 1850, yeah. So Chad was a pole vaulter. What was your best vault? 16-6. If I said to Chad, that, by the way, is, you look at Chad today, that's very good, isn't it, huh? 16-6 <laughs> is remarkable, maybe even unbelievable, okay? What if I told you that that's a very good vault, but if you want to be if you want an acceptable pole vault in God's eyes, you're going to have to pole vault 300 feet. Okay? Everyone, every pole vaulter on the earth would say, what? That's, there's no way. So here's, here's what you do in that situation. You say, that can't be right. What, what are most people doing? 16.6. Let's make that the acceptable. Okay? As long as you can go over 16.6, that's going to be acceptable you dumb the standard down to what's achievable. And this is what Paul and the Pharisees did. They looked at the law of God and they said, man, that's tough. We have to interpret this in a way to make it achievable. So they started coming up with their own code, their 614 laws that they came up with, and said, this is how you keep the law of God. You tithe this way, you do that. Here's what it means to, to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You start your fires the day before. I mean, they had all these regulations put together to make it achievable. So if you keep their 614, you're in good shape. But Jesus had something to say about the dumbing down process. You remember when the rich young ruler came to him? And he said, have you kept the law? And he said, yeah, I've done it all. And Jesus said, oh, really? Go and sell all you have and follow me. Let's see if you've kept the first commandment to love God above everything else. And the rich young ruler went away sad because he didn't live up to the law. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, you've heard it said, don't murder. And everybody said, okay, good, got that one, next. And he said, I say to you, don't have hate in your heart for anybody else. And don't call your brother a fool. Whoops. Remember the woman caught in adultery? Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Whoops. See, Jesus was continually saying, your dumbed down law will not get you to righteousness. You want perfect alignment with? You want fellowship into the... the you're not going to get there by keeping a dumbed down law. And that's still the most popular idea about how to achieve righteousness in our day. Go to the mall this afternoon and ask people, how do people get into heaven? What's the answer you're going to get? Try to live a good life. Try to keep the golden rule. You know, I try to do unto others as I would have them do. As long as I'm doing that, I think God will accept me in. Well, that's because you said, I, I can try to do that. And then ask them, so have you kept the golden rule? Have you always done unto others as you would? Well, no. But now you want, well, I tried. Okay, so it's not just doing it, it's just wanting to do it sometimes that gets you into heaven. That's how the average man's thinking. If I can dumb this down, if you ask most people, how good do you have to be to get into heaven, they will think you have to be good, at least as good as somebody who's a little less good than me. Right? So who's not going to heaven? Hitler and and. Osama bin Laden. Everybody else were kind of on a sliding scale. That's how most people think. Dumb the standard down, and that's what gets you to righteousness. That's not what the Bible teaches about righteousness. And Paul had to recognize this. There's a second response to this issue today. How do I achieve righteousness? And that is just disregard it. Hope if you don't think about it, it will go away. God says I have to be perfect as he is perfect. I don't think I can do that. Well, maybe I just won't think about it today. You ever had that situation? Like, let's say you're on your way somewhere and all of a sudden in your rearview mirror you see flashing lights and you hear a siren and you look at your speedometer and you go, whoops. Okay, let's say that happens to you. You get pulled over, officer says, do you realize that you were going 82 in a 70 mile hour? And you go, I didn't realize it. He says, here's a ticket and he hands it to you. You look at that ticket and you put it in the seat next to you and you go, I'm just not going to think about it. 
I'm just not going to worry myself. I'm on vacation. I'm not going to worry about this because I don't want it to ruin my vacation. I'll worry about it sometime when I get back. So then you get back from vacation. You go, I just don't even want to have to think about that. Do you think that if you don't think about it, that when it comes up before the judge, he's going to look at your ticket and go, oh, well, just forget it. No. You not thinking about it is not going to make it go away. And so most people, when they hear God's standard is perfect righteousness, they go, I just don't want to have to think about it. I'll think about that later. Because right now I'm just living and having fun. So some people dumb it down, some people disregard it. And then the third thing that people do with this call to perfect righteousness is they just, they just despair. <laughs> I mean, they just lose hope altogether. This is where Martin Luther was. When he was in the monastery training to be an Augustinian monk, and he knew that his life, he knew his thoughts, he knew his instincts were evil. And he was trying to purge his life from the evil. But every morning when he woke up, those evil thoughts were still there. And so he tried everything. He tried to beat his body and he tried to fast and he tried to pray more than the others. But the next morning when he woke up, the evil thoughts were still there. And he was in despair. And his, his monk father trainers, whatever they were, his, his, the people who were training him said, just relax, okay? You're getting a little too uptight about this. He was sinking into depression. Some people thought he was a little mentally unbalanced. He wasn't mentally unbalanced. He was staring at the reality of the situation and the reality of his life, and he was going, there's no hope, until he read Romans and saw the just shall live by faith. He went, oh, it's not through the obedience, it's through faith. Takes a paradigm shift. Paul had a paradigm shift while he was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus in Syria. In fact, let's look at, at the, keep your finger there in Romans 3, but flip over to Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read where the paradigm shift started for the Apostle Paul. And by the way, if the Apostle Paul was a member of our church, what you're going to read from Acts chapter 9 would be in the book Beauty for Ashes. This is his story of the paradigm shift in his life. And as we turn to Acts chapter 9, and as we turn our attention to God's word, let me pray for God to give us illumination. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word. It is alive. It is light. Your word delights our soul. Your word is wisdom. It's true. And we love your word because it teaches us about you. We pray that your word would do its work in our lives today. Make us more like Jesus give us ears to hear and by your spirit make us doers who delight to do your will we pray in Jesus name amen here's Paul's story the story of Paul's conversion as told by Luke in Acts 9 starting in verse 1 you follow along as I read but Saul that was Paul's name before he was converted it's his uh, Jewish name Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, that is, any Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He went to the high priest and said, give me papers, I'm going to go to the synagogue in Syria, and if I find any people who are Christians there, I want the temple guards there in Damascus to arrest them. I'm going to bring them to Jerusalem, and we're going to put them on trial here. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city. You'll be told what you're to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Amen. So here's the beginning of the paradigm shift in Paul's life. Now let me just make it clear. Paul didn't understand exactly what was going on. He didn't understand the gospel fully in that moment. Here's what he knew. I just met Jesus, 
and I thought Jesus had really died and had not been raised from the dead but it's true the resurrection is true I just met him and I'm going to do what he says and by the way let me just say that's the starting point for all of us on this journey there's a lot I didn't understand when I first came to faith there, there's a lot you didn't understand the moment you were saved you didn't have a, a lock tight airtight definition of righteousness you didn't know the gospel fully here's what you knew I just met Jesus he's alive and I'm going to do what he says that's the beginning point of the transformation the paradigm shift in our lives and I, I just need to say has that have you done that has that happened to you have you had that experience has that paradigm shift come in your life it can happen in a moment it can happen in a day if you're here this morning and you have been thinking that the way to earn God's favor is to be a good person you need a paradigm shift you need to meet Jesus and you need to say okay I'm gonna do what he says I'm gonna see what he has to say about this and I'm gonna follow him it's a simple prayer that you pray to God that says I surrender. I believe Jesus is who he says he is. I see that I've been heading the wrong way. I've been following my own instincts and my own impulses. I've been rebelling against you and doing my own thing. God, I want to surrender my life to you and follow you. That's the, the beginning of the paradigm shift as a believer. And I'll just add a second question here, which is, have you been baptized since you believed? Because we got one of those coming up on July 9th, and if you're here this morning, and since you believed you have not been baptized, this is a good opportunity for you to say, I really am serious about following Jesus. If that's what he's calling me to do, I'm ready to do it. So if, if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized since you were converted, come talk with us. Talk with any of the elders, talk with me, and let's talk about having that happen on July 9th. After meeting Jesus, Paul began to see that his way of trying to secure alignment with the purposes of God as a Pharisee wasn't what God had in mind at all. He began to see that the requirement of perfect alignment had to come by faith, not by the law. And that's what he declares back at the beginning of the book, the just, the righteous shall live by faith. So he lays out in the verses that Curtis looked at last week the, the essence of his new understanding. I used to think that by being a Pharisee and by following the law, I would achieve righteousness. Now I realize it is by faith. We're going to read through what Curtis took us through last Sunday, and then we'll get to the verses that we're going to address this week, okay? So follow along. We'll start Romans 3, verse 21. The first verses are the ones that Curtis took us through last week. Verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God, stop there, that's the perfect alignment of God within the Godhead, that's the purposes and ways of God, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Paul says before Jesus came, the only way that we knew anything about the purposes or the ways of God was by looking at the law. But now... The, the purposes and ways of God are understood apart from the law because we've seen Jesus. Although, he says, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. He says, when you look at the law and the prophets, you get a picture, but you don't get a complete picture. Jesus didn't abolish the law, did he? What did he do? He fulfilled it. The Old Testament laws and, and uh, bear perp they, they bear witness to the purpose and the ways of God, but Jesus is the fullness of that revelation. Now there is a new, better, more complete way to know what God is all about. It's by Jesus. The righteousness of God, this is verse 22, the righteousness of God comes uh, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There's no distinction because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now stop there. The Jew would say the Greeks are unrighteous because they don't know God's law and they don't live by it. But Paul has made it clear that the Jews who know God's law, they don't live by it either. So the Jews say, well, wait, we, we try to follow God's law. And he says, you try, but do you follow it completely, perfectly? No. And they say, well, come on, be realistic. Nobody does that. That's the point. That's the whole idea. All have sinned and fall short. And so any who are justified, verse 24 says, are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation 
by his blood to be received by faith. And Curtis dealt with that masterfully last week. But this is the idea. Anybody who ever achieves alignment with the purposes of God and the ways of God achieves that positionally in, by faith in Christ. You can't achieve it by the law. Jesus satisfies God's just requirement, and that's where this passage concludes by saying uh, God did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God can look at our sin, and when he looks at our sin, he sees over it, paid in full, signed Jesus. When he looks at Jesus, he sees in Jesus us. Our sin is covered by the perfect payment of Jesus. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, here come questions that Paul has. He's just laid out the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is, I used to think that if you're a good person, you, you had to try to be good to become righteous. Now I realize it's by faith that you become righteous. But that raises some questions. Here are the questions. Verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? Here's the answer. It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gen or is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Okay. So some questions and some answers. And we're right at the appropriate time to dig into these verses, so let me dig into them. I'm going to try to go through these pretty quickly because they're not hard to understand. But that first question is pretty interesting. What becomes of boasting? Paul's answer is it's excluded. The idea that we don't boast that our God is better than your God is a paradigm shift. In the ancient world, you rooted for your God the way that people in Arkansas root for the Razorbacks, okay? It's like the home team. If you grew up in Israel, you root for the God of Israel. Our God's better than your God. And this was just how they did it. And so the Jews believed that their God was the one true God over all the earth. And by the way, they were right. The Greeks believed in lots of gods. It is said that in the city of Athens, there were more gods than people. They had a God for this and a God for that. There were all kinds. It was all paganism. But the, the Romans and the Greeks thought that their philosophy and their pagan idol worship, they thought it was superior to all the things that the backwoods people in the Middle East believed. So they heard about the Jewish God and they go, that's just their tribal deity. But we know better. So everybody has this idea, our God's better than your God. And, and they would boast about it. And Paul says, Here, here's the new news. There's one God. He's the God of everybody, and boasting is excluded. You can't boast that your God is better, and you can't boast that you're better because you believe in the God you believe in. Now, this raises a question for us. Don't we as Christians believe that our God is the one true God, the better God, that all the other gods are wrong? Yes, we do. So are, aren't we boasting when we say that Christianity is the only way? No. No. Here's why. Let's say I'm a medical doctor, and someone comes to me, and they have a deadly disease, and there's only one cure for their deadly disease. You try any other cure, it's not going to work. You try the cure that I've got, it's going to work. Am I boasting if I say to my patient, all the other cures are not going to work. This is the only one that has a clinical trial that's so proven that'll work. Am I boasting about that? No. I'm just telling the truth. I'm just a doctor as the data. I'm saying, look, here, I've examined the data. Here's what will work. I'm saying, this is what I believe is true. And I've got the data to back it up. I'm not boasting. Now, boasting, though, can kind of subtly work into our thinking like that. It's easy for us to think as ourselves. In fact, it's human for us to think to ourselves that because we have come to understand what the truth is, that we are somehow better than other people. Ooh, now we're stepping on toes, right? Now we're at a point where you go, well, you know, I, uh, I put my faith in Jesus. I came, I surrendered my life to him. And somewhere in the back of our mind, there's this thought, that makes me smarter than other people. 
<laughs> that makes me morally superior to other people. That makes me more pious than other people. You see how that kind of works in the back of your mind? I'm a little more noble than others. You look at yourself, you look at other people who, like, like you see people going up to the Hindu temples, and you think to yourself, those poor people. And somewhere in the back of your mind, it's like, if they were just as smart as me, they would abandon their Hinduism. We see people like that and we think their beliefs are wrong. That's not the issue. The issue is when we think or we convey in some way that, our, uh, that we are better because our God is better, that we are better people because of what we've come to believe. Anybody in this room who loves Jesus, who's committed his or her life to him, here's what you need to know. That didn't happen because of anything you did. Okay? You're, you're not a Christian today because you're smarter or more moral or more noble than the people who are going to the Hindu temple th this afternoon, okay? It happened because God opened your eyes to see the truth, and you say, well, why didn't he open their, th those other people's eyes? I don't know. All I know is he opened your eyes to see the truth, and that's not because you were better or more lovable or more likable. It's because God, for his divine purposes, says, this is what I'm going to do, and he opened your eyes. And that doesn't make you better off. In fact, this ought to be the when, when you see somebody who is acting immorally or believing pagan gods or other things, rather than thinking, oh, those poor, poor people, here's what you ought to be thinking. If it weren't for God having opened my, my, my eyes, that would be me. There but for the grace of God go I. The Greeks thought their religion was superior. The average Roman thought their religion, look what they did, the Christians, right? We believe what we believe, not because we're smarter, but because God's grace is amazing. When I first got my head around that idea that the reason I was a follower of Jesus was because of what God, for his own reasons and purposes, had done in opening my eyes to the truth, two things happened in my life. The first thing is, I saw my pride for what it really was, and I was ashamed. I saw how deep-rooted this idea of my betterness was in me, and it was crushed. The second thing is I saw God's grace as bigger and more grand than I had ever understood it to be. And when I saw that, the reality of my pride and the reality of God's grace, it was a paradigm shift. I went into light speed, okay, into hyperdrive. So if you're here as a follower of Christ, boasting is excluded. You have nothing to boast about. John Stott says this, all human beings are inveterate boasters. Boasting is the language of our fallen self-centeredness. Praising, not boasting, is the characteristic activity of justified believers and will be throughout eternity. Don't boast, praise. Every time you feel the impulse to feel a little prouder, turn that impulse into praise for God. If we're saved by obedience to the law, there'd be room for boasting. In fact, that's what Paul says in verse 27 here. He says, he talks about, are, are, can we be saved by the works of the law? No, it's by the works of faith or by the law of faith. But if we're saved by faith, even the faith that we're saved by, where did that come from? From God, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you're saved by grace through faith, and that faith is not of yourself, lest anyone should boast. The faith that you have to believe the gospel didn't come from you. It came from God. Boasting is excluded. If faith in Jesus doesn't make you more humble, something's wrong. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, whenever we find our religion, our religious life is making us feel that we are good, above all that we're better than someone else, I think we may be sure that we're being acted on not by God, but by the devil. The real test of being in the presence of God is that you either forget about yourself altogether or see yourself as a small, dirty object. It's better to forget about yourself altogether. <laughs> Boasting is out. Next question, Paul says, so is God the God of everyone? Greeks and Jews? And the answer is yes. Now remember, he's speaking in a polytheistic world. 
tons of gods. And he's suggesting that the God he's talking about is the only one true God. And this is another paradigm shift for his readers. We believe, as Paul teaches in Ephesians 4, that there is one faith, one hope, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Now, we hold to that truth. There is one God. He is the God of all. There are not, there's not a God over India and a God over the United States, and it's not two different gods. There's one God over the whole universe. There's a corollary that comes to that along with that. If God is the God of all, then all people are God's people. Now, hear me. We are all God's creation. We're not all God's children. Got to be careful on this. Because out in the world, if you, out, you go out today to the mall again and you say, do you believe everybody is a child of God? That we're all God's children. That's kind of a nice, sentimental, romantic idea. That all people are God's children. We, we, we sing songs like that in, in our secular world. But the truth is, we're all God's creation. We're all created in the image of God. We are all image bearers, and we all have dignity. All human beings of every tongue, tribe, creed, every color, every human being has the nobility that comes with having the image of God on their soul. But to become a child of God requires a paradigm shift requires a surrendering and saying righteousness is not found in good works, it is found in faith. I did an interview once with a prominent evangelical pastor. And this pastor is very pro-Israel. In fact, he used to have a big event every year that was called a night to honor Israel. And he would invite people in and it was all about let's honor our Jewish friends. And this pastor, and the problem here was the pastor told me he believed that Jews, modern day Jews, could be saved by keeping the law, by their obedience to the law. That they, were, they could be saved through the Old Covenant. Well, he hadn't read Romans 3. There's one God, there's one way of salvation. The, it is faith for the uncircumcised and it's faith for the circumcised. There is not another way. So there's one God, all humanity bears the image of God and as a result, God does not show partiality or distinction to races, creeds, or colors. We shouldn't either. Last thing. Final question, verse 31. Does the gospel of grace overthrow the law? Is the law now to be ignored? Has it been booted out of office by grace? The answer is a clear no here. He uses that phrase we've already seen, meganointa, the Greek phrase, may it never be. He's used it twice before in Romans 3. He uses it again. He says the truth is that the gospel doesn't abolish the law. The gospel upholds the law. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's the best illustration I can give you on this. The relationship between the Old Testament law and the revelation of Jesus. God's law was like giving his people half of the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and not giving them the box top. So if I gave you a baggie today and it had half of the pieces from a jigsaw puzzle, just randomly, I picked half of them. It's a 500 piece puzzle. I give you 250 of the pieces. I give them to you and no box top and you take that home. Could you put together any of that? Sure you could. You could get some colors and you could go, this looks like a bird's beak and this look so you could maybe get a little of it put together do we have put up pictures okay so it could look like this right I mean you might be able to pick that out if you had half the pieces and you worked on it long enough you could get half of it worked out but what if I then gave you the rest of the pieces and the box top then you could put the whole puzzle together right because having the box top and having all of the pieces now you can solve the puzzle here's the point in the Old Testament, the law is half the pieces and no box top. Any benefit to that? Yeah. You can get part of the picture. You can see some of it. Jesus comes and says, I didn't come to abolish the law. In other words, he's saying, I didn't come and say, all those old pieces you have, throw those out. No, he says, I came to fulfill the law. I came to give you the rest of the pieces, and I'm the box top. So you take the pieces I've given you, the Old Testament, now you've got the New Testament, I'm the box top, now you can solve the puzzle, can't you? 
That's what Jesus is saying when he says grace doesn't abolish the law. Now you understand what the law was for in the first place. You didn't understand that before. Now you see the whole picture. So the law still has purpose. It's just a different purpose than the Jews thought it was. The Jews thought the law was the path to righteousness. No, the law is the path to despair, and despair is the path to Jesus, and Jesus is the path to righteousness. That's the purpose. Now, what Paul's going to do next is he's going to call to the witness stand a surprise witness who is going to come and testify that it has always been that way, that the way to God is by faith. You can read ahead, and it's Abraham he's going to call, okay? So that's the surprise witness, but that's next week. We won't get there this week. This week, what we want to do is we want to celebrate the goodness of God in the gospel that we've just seen, that we were hopeless to get to righteousness, alignment with the purpose and the will of God through obedience or through good works. We were hopeless to do that through the law. But God comes and says, by faith in the Son, who was always in perfect alignment with the purposes and will of God, who lived a life in perfect alignment, and then who died the death that you deserve, by faith in him, you can come in to the fellowship and be a child of God. You come in positionally righteous, and you become perfectly righteous as you grow in goodness and are one day glorified. We celebrate that by coming to this table where we pick up a piece of bread and a cup of juice or wine, and in that moment we reflect on the fact that the way to righteousness is through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And this is what he pointed us to. This is what he told us, how he told us to come and to remember these things. If you're here this morning as a guest or as a visitor, we practice open communion. What we mean by that is that anybody who knows and loves Jesus is welcome at the table to come and receive the bread and the juice. If you're not a believer, if you have questions about it, I would recommend to you that you not come and get bread and juice. And the reason is because God says that in doing that, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. If you eat the bread and drink the juice and you don't know Jesus, you've invited judgment of God. You said, I'm a rebel, but I'm going to go through this game. Don't do that. Instead, come and let's talk about how to become a child of God. For the rest of us, we'll come down the outer aisle here. We'll take the bread and the juice back to our seats. We'll take them together here in a few minutes. Um, And and let me just say this, too. If, If you're here this morning and there's some area in your life that is a an unsurrendered area of sinful rebellion against God, something that you've looked at and it's It's just an area that you're hanging on to and you're unwilling to let go of. I would encourage you, coming to this table needs to be a a point of surrender each week. It's a point of saying, I I, want to be in perfect alignment with the ways and the purposes of God. And if your stubborn heart is saying, no, I don't want to be in perfect alignment, then rather than coming to the table, you need to get right with God and then come to the table. We can talk more about that if you need to after the service. So... Uh, Take a few minutes, prepare your hearts, examine your hearts, and then uh, we'll take communion together here in just a minute. as you're ready this morning.
having faith is not what saves a person. It is the object of our faith that brings salvation. Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, took bread, and in the Passover meal, he tore the bread and he passed it to his disciples. He said, this bread is my body, about to be torn, about to be broken for you. So often as you receive this, remember me. So Lord Jesus, this morning as we take this bread, we acknowledge that you are the object of our faith, that our trust is in you, our hope is in you. We are saved by you, not by our faith. We are saved because your bruised body and your shed blood paid the price for our sin. So we receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. After the meal was over, Jesus took the cup. He prayed a prayer of blessing, and then he passed the cup. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the paradigm shift. The old covenant was the covenant of works, and no man was ever justified or made righteous by the covenant of works. The new covenant is the rest of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and the box top that makes it clear that the just live by faith. So he says, this blood is the blood of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. And so again, Lord Jesus, we reflect on the fact that while our human hearts are prone to wanting personal accomplishment and achievement to mark us, we cannot be good enough. We surrender our goodness to you and it is on your goodness that we rely. Thank you for your shed blood. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. Let's sing the verse in uh, When I Survey that says, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. We'll sing that together. Stand, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction after we've sung it. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my All the vain things that charm I sacrifice them to his blood. And now receive this blessing from God with open hearts and open hands. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, abide in peace. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next Sunday.